that's really where this grew out of. I was frustrated as an educator because I was seeing all these amazing creative kids that were getting a graduation without any tangible real world skills. Uh, students that, you know, maybe in a different environment would have been going to, you know, you name it, four year university. Uh, and then the young people that I was working with in the community uh, were just being kind of pushed out of the system. What they were learning wasn't relevant, engaging and I uh, just said, God, you know, we're, there's got to be a better way. And uh, when you look statistically uh, you know, on a national basis, pretty similar. But in California, only 30 percent of California freshmen are going to get a college degree. And then, you know, look at that even further and say, well, how many of those kids that are getting a college degree are using that degree? Uh, yet our education system set up in this college for all kind of mindset, I think. You know, we've seen even since I've been on, on uh, working to, to get CCA open and now, you know, as we're, we're kind of getting to that that point where your know, facilities wrapping up and, and kids are enrolled. Uh, but even in that since 2019 and now, I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a shift uh, away from that college girl narrative. And I think schools are starting to recognize we've got to do more uh, for our students. And um, I'll just add another point that my frustration also a lot of times in education, and, and this comes from a variety of reasons, you know, the metrics the school's being graded on, or, you know, the, the pressures of, of you know, maybe the, the entity that is the organization, but I think sometimes all those metrics, uh, you know, it, it comes at the expense of students where, you know, typically that middle school, high school year should be a time of exploration and finding one's interest and passion. Instead, it's you've got to be on this pathway. And if for some reason you deviate, you've in some way failed. And so uh, as we have we set out to create Capital College and Career Academy, never want to pigeon a young person, and pigeon a whole young person, and instead get them to graduation with as many doors open as possible. You and I have an aligned philosophy. I've got a master's degree in business administration, yeah. and I did it when I was much later in my career, just did it right. recently. But as a kid, I'm in grade school and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm coaching. This uh, teacher assigns me to coach this kid. He's having trouble and his name, let's say his name is Brad. So I help Brad. Brad likes to like play in the woods. He's got short attention span, smart kid, just not book smart. It's totally, he's got skills to live. So fast forward, I find out later, I graduate from college, electrical engineering. Brad does not go to college, becomes an entrepreneur, starts a log cabin custom home building business as a multimillionaire. But I was coaching him on spelling, right? (laughs) So he gets to, he gets out of school, becomes a successful entrepreneur. I get out of school and I get to take on student loan debt and then uh, work my way through construction the hard way. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem system. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last planet. Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refund My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refund My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now to the show. Welcome to the show, Kevin Dobson. <laughs> All right. So 
<laughs> and we're, if you're wondering like, why am I not in the regular studio people? Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's because sometimes I have to travel and uh, nothing can stop the show. <laughs> That's what I tell people. And Kevin is one of the people making life easier, better, and faster for future generations of builders. And everybody knows how we have this uh, skilled labor shortage issue. And everybody complains, like, what do you can do about it? And like a lot of people just like to complain. And Kevin, you're doing something about it. So that's why I wanted to have you come on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. I'm just excited to you know have the conversation and uh, share the work we do. And I mean, that's what it's all about. For people that don't know Kevin, can you tell people where you are? And then while he's telling all of you about himself, a better and longer bio is going to be in the description below, including links to the Capital College and Career Academy, where you can learn more about this program here in the capital city, Sacramento. And while you're clicking on that description, it's a great time to tap that like button so that Kevin knows that you actually like this show. Yeah, so um, I guess we could start at my background. I am uh, from the East Coast originally. I've been in Sacramento now for about 12 years. Uh, background was as a high school history teacher, uh, eventually a middle school teacher, and then I became a high school principal. Uh, but I live right in the community where our school is located and volunteer coach little league baseball what is the option that you're giving kids in the sacramento area well i'll start by uh kind of piggybacking off of your personal story i mean that was as we were getting ccc off the ground and trying to get partners about that was my talking point i'm like look i'm a high school principal i've got three college degrees and a kid can leave our school and make more money than me i mean something's <laughs> wrong with that system and so uh, with our model the idea is and, and I think you can understand and appreciate this, uh, you know, being in the construction industry, there are so many career opportunities available. But when you say construction to the lay person, they're like, oh, I'm going to go hammer all day long. I don't want my daughter to do that. Or I mean, we've heard this from parents or, right. and they're going to go be a plumber. Or, and there's nothing wrong with those careers. But that's this perception that's out there. Right. And so uh, what we really build ourselves and we build into our name, it's about getting in acceleration to college getting career ready so it's college and career academy and we really have tried to expose young people to the full scope of the construction industry and that includes all of those tertiary careers what that looks like and how we accomplish that we have a career fair on our campus where uh, as students are transitioning to their second semester on campus as a freshman in ninth grade uh, they get to self-select and hear from these employers. It's, it's a job fair type of environment. They get to hear from the employers, you know, what that company does. And so the company essentially selling themselves and giving that kind of high level overview. Students are going to self-select the employer. They, they rate them on you know, one, two, and three, uh, you know, one being the highest preference. And obviously our goal is to get everyone into the number one choice, you know, but the business can't take on, you know, a hundred kids. So, right. uh, you know, it's, the idea is to place them at least into one of those top three. And then uh, what happens is through the course of the semester, every Tuesday, Thursday for half a day, uh, no more than eight hours total in a week, students are with that employer seeing all of the different departments that that company does. And obviously uh, that job shadow is going to depend on the size and scope of the company. They're at a, a major company, a huge player, and they may only spend one day in each of those departments that that company has through the course of the semester. It's a smaller mom and pop play. They're just spending a week, a month in a department. The idea, though, is just to get that exposure so young people can say, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't know you guys did this or this is interesting. Didn't know you did this. And I don't ever want to do that. And that's equally <laughs> valuable. right? And <laughs> Super so we, valuable. Yeah, because the current system is that whole exploration happens after high school when the stakes are exponentially higher. If you're going to college, you're racking up debt. And so it's like, how do we shift that directly into our model and get kids to, to just see what they like? And so by the end of sophomore year, they've gone through three rounds of this career exploration, three different companies, seen all of the careers associated with that company. And ultimately, the goal is to, as, as students are developing this cumulative portfolio, they are starting to identify what is my passion, what gets me excited. And then by junior, senior year, we pair that young person with an employer to provide the work readiness skills. Um, I, I will just say that at the, at the offset of this, we, we talked to so many different employers and just listen. And one of the things we heard over and over and over again from employers was, one, 
education institutions are not preparing the workforce that we need. They're just not doing that in an adequate manner. Two, even when we find a program, we support a program, it seems to be working, then unfortunately, they're often not nimble enough to really meet the changing nature of, of industry. And so that was an epiphany for us to say, well, you know, there's no way as a single site charter school we're ever going to be able to you know, teach all the, the vast careers that exist within construction. Why don't we just pair them with employees? You guys know what you need. You know what type of training is required. Uh, so that's what better place to put a young person to get career ready than with the employer directly. Yeah, that's a perfect way to go. I, I 100% support that, Kevin. <laughs> so virtual fist bump from the, the screen there. <laughs> and I'd say like, uh, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough that when I did my engineering, I studied electrical engineering in undergrad. I had an older professor and he said that, you know, the way that we teach you now, I don't like. And he spent time telling us in the class, like what he hated about it. He said, you know, it was, it was like some 10 or 15 years prior. Yeah. I, don't, I don't date myself. Like people who watch my show know <laughs> roughly how old I am. So, you know, you can't, you can't tell from the sound of my voice how old I am. But uh, he said like 10, 15 years prior, you would do two years in engineering coursework and then mm -hmm. you'd go to work in industry for mm -hmm. at least at least one year yeah and then you'd yeah. come back in and then you'd refine skills and build on what you learned so you're constantly getting feedback from industry and it was influencing what was being taught in the curriculum yeah. and, and then my experience was like a complete disconnect like what we learned in in school had nothing to do with what electrical engineers needed to do. And like, I've heard the same thing with construction employers as well. Like yeah, there's a, this is a true story, Kevin. There was a young woman, I was working for a GC general contractor in Southern California and she graduates from school as a CM. So she's done four years of school. Yep. She's like convinced this is what I want to do. Comes to work. The trailer has no, no permanent toilets, no running water. It's a, it's a small site. It's only like a $20 million job. It's, it's tiny. You got to walk through excavations to get to the construction trail, which is odd in of itself. And I don't recommend setting up your logistics this way for people listening, but this is the condition that she found herself on day one. She yeah. went from a very prestigious college university yeah. with very luxurious dorms to a trailer with no running water. And the coffee maker was on the floor not even on a table. There wasn't even a table for it. And she quit. She quit and said, and she quit after three days. And she told the project manager, this is not the industry for me. I'm out. And nothing they could say could convince her to stay. Right. Yeah. So she, it was just like night and day. Yeah. So like what you're doing, I've heard young kids, like I have a 13 year old at home. He's in seventh grade now. And he's like, before I go to college, dad, I want to weld something. I want to solder something. I want to cut something and I want to build something. All right. Well, uh, he can do all of that starting next Wednesday because we got a middle school program that we're running where they do every one of those activities after school meals and a $300 stipend. So Ooh. let's talk about that offline. Yeah, let's talk <laughs> about that. Yeah, let's make that happen. You brought up though another interesting point, and and I think uh, what's important to us, we've actually budgeted for teachers to do externships as well. You know, there's a lot of great programs within Sacramento, nationwide, uh, CT programs, these construction technical education program or career technical education program. But oftentimes it's kind of isolated. It's like this great class. I go back and it's my normal English, my normal math, my normal science. And so as us being a single site high school, all fully immersed in construction, it's how do we make every bit of the learning experience relevant and engaging to the construction industry? And that starts with the teacher. So we pay for teacher externships at the end of the year. So they get to go be with an employer that's within the vein of what they're teaching, uh, just to make sure that what they're teaching is relevant and engaging. And, and I'll give an example. We went out to uh, Caltrans. They have a material testing facility in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. I went out there and I was like, I'm a history guy. I was like, oh my God, there are so many applications for science in this. Play. I mean, they, they, yeah. they beat up asphalt, the paint, the little glass beads that are reflective. And like, it just, it gets you so exciting. And so get the teacher to make those connections, the content area experts, so that they're fired up about things. And then every class, like I said, has that, that construction tie-in. So for example, our science, the high school science pathway, it's going to get you your minimum requirements for UCCSU. Actually, our graduation requirements exceed that. 
but our science curriculum was developed by Caltrans and SMUD. And so yeah. it's just green energy, environmental science, utilities pathway, we have an entrepreneurship English class, an engineering math, architect and, and CAD design art class. And so, um, you know, the goal is never that you're going to have a graduate lead and say, I love this. And then they're like, whoa, this is way different than I thought, right? It should be a clear picture throughout the way. Yes. So you didn't just waste four years of your life. That's right. It's it's very hard to pivot, like especially when you've you've escalated all that and you're like yeah. and kids, you know, you come out, like I still said electrical engineer, right? My last name is coincidentally engineer. And yeah. so it's kind of like I can't get away from the label like other people can. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. other people can yeah. get away from it, but I can't, Kevin. Yeah. I yep. think, I think what you're doing, uh, being born from that frustration is why I could hear the passion just comes through and like, <laughs> I fully trust you, Kevin, I'm going to just give you my kid and just dump <laughs> him in your school. And then I'm going to let, I'm going to put him to work. I got so many ideas of stuff to do around the house, oh, and, uh, things that my wife has wanted me to do, but I don't have the skills. And so like, I think this kid is going to be my savior. <laughs> you, know, you know, here's a funny thing, too, that I'll say, um, because, you know, you've got a seventh grader and I've heard from so many parents, oh, kids nowadays and, you know, they don't they don't want to work with their hands and they don't they don't get excited about something like that. Or they just want to be on the computer. I will say resoundingly from all the youth programs we've done, we've had over 500 girls participate in our STEM events that we do with the Girl Scouts. Um, we've had over 90 middle schoolers in our campus through the fall. You give kids the like, you know, an arc welder, or they get a hammer in their hand, they get to build a tool, they get excited. And that's where I think we can fit in and support the industry in a different way because oftentimes construction's coming in at the high school level where kids have already made up their mind. They've been told over and over and beaten over their head that they have to go to college. And if they don't go to college, they're a failure. And so, you know, they're getting the pressure at home. But if we can get the parents and kids just excited about working for, with their hands, then they get to our school. And, and I, I think we just have such a great proposition, add proposition to families. We, we tell an eighth grader, say, hey, next year, do you just want to listen to a teacher? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lecture team, you're sitting in a row and you want to build things. You want to work with your hands. And every day you get to be creative. And, um, you know, at the, at the end of that, when we get kids in, I just say, if, if you're passionate, you like working with your hands, you're going to find something in the construction trade to get you excited. Absolutely true. And and the funny thing is like uh, my son's grandfather gave him a toolbox, but they actually built it together. Oh, that's so so cool. one of the things they did last summer is they built this toolbox. And then I had to, you know, being the good dad, I had to give him tools. And as a construction joke, dad thing that I gave him, I was like, here's going to be your most used tool ever, a hammer. So <laughs> yep. I bought him a hammer. That's and, awesome. And Kevin, it wasn't even 10 seconds. The kid was hammering the washing machine. <laughs> and, and I don't know how my wife heard it. She's got like some kind of sixth sense and she knows that finished goods are being damaged. She was on both of us. Like, why would you give him the hammer in this room? Like, I was like, I don't know. The kid has a hammer and the washing machine looked like a nail. So it's just goes to prove that, you know, what's possible, yep. but yep. Uh, yeah, no, no permanent damage, no permanent damage. <laughs> I, love I it. think the, uh, you know, the cool thing is how that, that externship program with the teachers is really bridging the gap between, you know, what's being taught. And I was talking about this with my wife the other day, and she was telling me she studied business. I studied engineering. She said her favorite business teachers were those that actually had their own businesses. Yep. And she yep. could tell, like once she had the taste of one of those types of teachers, yep. the other teachers was like having the volume turn way down. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent agree. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. and I got to I got to give a shameless plug to uh, the American Journal Contractors Association in California has a program called Build California, and I'm a yep. Build California ambassador. So, one of the Great. things I get to do in my free my free time, Kevin, all my free time that I have, is I get to go, go to schools and talk about careers in construction, both trade careers and project management careers. And we answer uh, AGC California arms us with different types of jobs, uh, union and non union trades. Like, what are the typical salaries? You know, what do people make? What are the job conditions like? And then since I'm, I'm on the project management side, I get to answer like all the office stuff. Like, you know, why do people say herding cats? Why we use that phrasing? Like, just honestly, point blank. And, I, and the teachers, some of the teachers will say like, 
you know, these kids don't, and we started, I started doing this when, during COVID. So it'd be like a team's call. It couldn't be like in the classroom. And we're, yep. we're now back to like in the classroom, like going to schools. And I've gone to a couple of different schools in the last year, but I tell the teachers like, listen, the stuff that we do, we get to like take buildings down, play in the dirt, make fires, <laughs> put fires out. I just, yep. It's true, Kevin. I just yep. heard from this job. I was, I'm on this job. I don't want to say where it is because I got I to gotta protect the guilty. And they told me that there are multiple fires every day on this job. And, yep. and, and people are just cool with it. And everybody's like, oh, it's just normal. Yeah, like we're all going to fight fires, to, like literal fires. Oh, my God. And, like, and that's construction. And people like are excited. That nobody ever gets hurt. It's just part of that type of work. Yeah. So. Well, I think, I mean, you didn't, you didn't explicitly say it, but I think, you know, that's another part that's really resonated with me is that, you know, the construction industry is such a family. And, and I think maybe the reason for that is because, you know, with every job, you're united around a common goal, right? And, and you're working with such diverse group of people to achieve that goal and, you know, come in on time at budget. And uh, you know, that's one of the things that I think, particularly the community where we're at, uh, that that ability to have this supportive family is, is you know so so critical. And then the other piece, and this is built into the model, is is through these career explorations, through that partnership with industry for the internships. The other side of that is like you're building human capital. I, I remember when I got out of college, and you're you're looking for jobs, and everything's like, well, you need to have experience. Well, how the hell can I have experience if I'm just starting, <laughs> yeah. right? Right. And so, you know, luckily you do internships or whatever it may be, but that was always the thing that struck it, stuck out to me. It's like all these positions, you need experience, but how, how do you, how do you get that? Um, and, and so between the human capital and the, the lived experiences, you know, we should be preparing young people, you know, again, to move into to meaningful careers that they're interested and passionate about. Absolutely true. And, and, the, and we just had a shift in our, our household where, for the longest time, since my son was like five years old, he was like, he's going to be a psychologist. And I don't know how a five-year-old knows this, Kevin, but it turns out his five-year-old self was wrong and he doesn't actually want to be a psychologist. Now he wants to be a mechanical engineer and he wants to come work in construction because I think I made construction look cool. And you know what, people, yeah. it is freaking cool. It's a, it is. It is a great job. Like this, yeah. is, this is true. So part of my job. So today we had a superintendent meeting. And I got to go to a diner and have breakfast with 20 plus superintendents. And like, that's, oh, that's my job. Like that's yeah, the day, awesome. right? That's like, awesome. so people that's listening, awesome. Like, this is the, this is the day in the life right here. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, they all went to 20 plus different projects to go lead. And there's some stuff that's like billion dollar size, like super mega crazy, complicated, complex down yeah. to like a simple, like, let's change the siding on this medical building clinic so yeah. that, that we, you know, keep it nice and that, you know, it's not going to, you know, get the termites out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's I'm awesome. not saying there's, I'm not saying there's termites there people. So if you're listening, if you're the owner of that project, I'm not saying you have termites. I'm just saying we're making your siding look nice. It's a and change it's, order. Yeah. That's what you want. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Kevin knows. He knows the vernacular. <laughs> Oh man, we're going through the construction project now and it's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's fun to see it at this point, but man, all the surprises that come with doing a tenant improvement on a building that predates the forties. Um, yeah, it keeps it, it keeps it interesting. Yeah, that definitely does. My, the first time I got to be a superintendent on a project early in my career, it was the old Montgomery Ward world headquarters in wow. 1890. It was built in 1898, I believe. So it was like oh, at, at, for six months, Kevin, it was the world's tallest building at, wow. at, at 21 stories tall. And we, we built it up to 25 stories. So we added some additional floors to it as part of our, our, our process, but it was cool to tap into some super old. So I, I can appreciate you tapping into something pre 1940. Yeah. Well, um, this is probably more detailed than we need to know, but what's interesting, uh, North Sacramento used to be its own city. And evidently, uh, what what happened is there was all this infighting in North Sacramento where we're located. This is like pre World War II, and then what ended up happening is the the city voted to merge with the city of Sacramento. They thought it would get over some of the local politics. Well, 
evidently the, the 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 story is that the city planner was so pissed off and frustrated that this happened that he had a bonfire behind city hall and burnt all the historical documents and so all these buildings that predate world war ii was like missing records evidently and so our purchase documents show that this building was built in 1960 something but we look at our aerial maps and the, the buildings there all the way back prior to 1940 so uh you know just there little local history that stuff loves me yeah. love, i love the local history like i said i used to be a history teacher so it's it's cool to be in a space as well that that you know there, there's something to it right it's not just this brand new building you know it, it's it's got some uh some old bones to it oh yeah it does what uh where'd you grow up in back east kevin so i grew up right outside philadelphia went to college in western massachusetts and then uh made my way out to california yeah you want to talk about some beautiful buildings i've been to philadelphia and uh, in Boston, first of all, never heard so many car honking horns in my life. In That's New York City. I say first... people use their horn more than a turn signal in New York City. <laughs> yes. That's like, I think that's just how people talk. Like, oh, it's a yeah. it's a phenomenon. I grew up in Chicago, and okay. that doesn't, uh, doesn't really occur there. And yeah. here in California, yeah. I can go like a year and never hear a car, car horn. Back to Capital College and Career Academy, you know, you talked about your school's just getting started. You're just getting built. Yeah. When when are we going to see kids like start to finish go through? What what kind of stories do you already have? Yes, yeah, so August third is is when we officially begin. Uh, that's our first ninth grade class. They'll become our first graduating class. So current eighth graders are are moving into to the school. Um, I would just say already. I mean, there's been a couple things. Uh, we did a family night at Sacramento State because that dual enrollment partnership, yeah. taking college class by high school. Uh, like that's a big part of the program. And I was riding the elevator down with uh, the, the parent. It's, it's a grandparent who is you know, the guardian of the, the student. And uh, she goes, is it always this busy? I've never been on a college campus ever. And I just thought that was amazing to just, you know, just a microcosm of, of the opportunities available to young people. And uh, we had another family. They're driving over an hour to the school. They're coming from Jackson. And uh, the mom was, I was like, how did you hear about it? I, like, did you sign up on purpose? Do you know where we're at? <laughs> she was like, yeah, I saw it. I saw your ads and looked it up. And I just said, this is an opportunity unlike any other. And we're going to make sure that he's at school, you know, five days a week for the next four years because we have to do this. Um, and then I'll give you the third one. We had uh, a young girl who uh, lives in the local community. She does social media. Her dad is a, a small residential concrete company and she does social media for him. And so she kind of already had some insight into the industry, but uh, she was on at the groundbreaking. She did an interview with one of local news outlets and talked about this, but she just said, you know, I, I stepped foot on this campus and knew that this place could change my entire life trajectory. And I knew that I had to come here and I knew I had to be a part of this. And so, you know, I get goosebumps just talking about it because yeah. it's like, that, that's, that's why, that's why we do this stuff. Right. And, you know, I'll say since 2019, to get the doors open, so much politics and quite frankly, just so much BS that isn't about kids. And it's uh, <laughs> to, to finally be at the point where we're ready to start serving kids and making an impact in the community and rethinking the way that we do education. Uh, it, it's incredibly exciting, uh, but it's also, you know, I feel such a, an incredible amount of responsibility. I was talking to somebody just just the other day. Families are trusting us as a brand new school, as just an idea that look, these are some of, you could argue some of the four most critical years in determining where a young person is going to end up. You know, you, you're going to complete high school, you're going to go into college, you know, and, and so you know, we got to live up to those expectations. We have a responsibility to do that because these families, these kids are trusting us. And so, you know, that's, that's what we come to work every day to do. How big is the, uh, the staff at the school, like teachers and administrators total? Yes, yeah, so we're starting small, uh, both with students and the staff, and intentionally so. We will really want to build this culture of inclusivity, of uh, make sure that we're hitting all our metrics, and just again make sure that from the day one we're doing things the right way. So we've, uh, depending on some grants and some part time versus full time, we could go up to a, a seven teaching staff in year one. At a minimum, we'll be at five. That's what we're hiring for right now. Uh, and then student body, we're looking at about eighty students as the target could over enroll we could go up to 120 uh but you know that 80 80 number is, is really our, our target uh, so currently we're we've we've seen no less than two kids enroll every single week since the new year 
I think as of today, we're at 60, 61 kids. So continuing to, to kind of move the needle forward there and uh, anticipate, you know, if not meeting, but but definitely uh, it potentially exceeding those, those enrollment projections. That's awesome. I'm going to move this episode up, Kevin, so that we get it uh, to air before the August 4th date when construction finishes That'd be great. to help your enrollment numbers. I'm sure the parents listening right now are like, how do I enroll my kid or where can I learn more? Where, where should yeah. people go, Kevin, to learn more about enrollment? Yeah, so they go to our website at capcca.org, so capcca.org. Uh, all the information's on there. We're also on virtually every social media platform. Apparently, we have a TikTok. We're on Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, LinkedIn. So uh, connect them with us on any of our social media platforms as well. And then uh, I will also just say that we, you know, every day we're, we're happy to give a tour. I live around the corner, whether it's a weekend, at night. And we'll make it happen. So if you want to come out and see the campus, happy, happy to do that. Yeah, I think, well, now that you dropped the, the TikTok gauntlet, I will come out for the sole purpose of making TikToks with you as we tour the campus, which is something that I usually do when I'm on the Bill California ambassador train. I like to always do at least one TikTok with the students, with the teacher, with the class. And we don't have to dance, Kevin. It could just be about the building. I won't make you do a synchronized dance with me. Oh man, I was looking forward to the dance, but uh, somehow I've managed to not be on the TikTok up until this point. So maybe you can uh, break that that that. Uh, I'll, I'll break. Tra- I'll trend. break your TikTok training wheels right off. <laughs> that sounds good. We'll get you as like as my son says. I should never say the tick and the talk. We'll get you <laughs> on the tick and the talk soon. <laughs> so awesome. I, I want to say I want to ask you like with all the you're getting a brand new building that's getting renovated, so it's going to be cutting edge for what you need. What kind of technology am I going to see in the classroom for the students? One of the things that I would say is within the building trades room, we've got pretty much all of your basic tools. We've got 3D printers in the, the, the tech room. But I would say that in terms of technology, we really, our goal is to get foundational skills and to make it hands-on. I mean, this is not going to be a school where you see all the kids on Chromebooks typing away. Uh, we, we've set up the desk intentionally so where they are collaborative. A lot of the tables are on casters, able to move around. And, and uh, we, we want this to be an active school site. And then as we lay that foundation, when we get to more technical training, that's happening with the community college partner, with the industry partners. Uh, the other thing that I think is unique with our room, we've intentionally designed all the classrooms where there's no front of the room. You know, most you go into pretty much any high school, middle school classroom, you're going to have a whiteboard at the front and kids are in rows. And so uh, what we have is, is TV screens uh, on multiple walls where you can project to. And so it's by design, forcing the teacher to be collaborative, to rethink their classroom. You know, students have the ability to project their screens. Teachers have the ability to project. Got lots of whiteboard walls. And then the coolest feature of our entire school is we have these four indoor outdoor green spaces where it is walled on four sides between the classrooms, accessible from the classroom, but it's open air. So one's got this bamboo forest. Uh, yeah. Another one's got this rock garden. Uh, we've got this other one we built out of deck with some plantings. And then the last one, the water feature. So this is amazing rest that's just built right into the school campus. And you have all the research around green spaces and what that does for, for learning and for, for people as a whole. You make me want to go back to school. <laughs> You're making me, and I mean, I, I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. And I have a whiteboard right here over my shoulder. I mean, that's how go. much... And there's, and you can't see it, but there's another whiteboard in front of me as well, nice. surrounded by whiteboard. That was there like a go. prerequisite. In my <laughs> house, we actually have, uh, in my son's room, he's, we, we built out this learning space. So my wife and I were very intentional when we set up his learning space. He's got multiple whiteboards in his room and his room is just like incredible with like inspiration, you know, from combustion engine to like galaxy solar system Fun wow. facts. And then, of course, there's the obligatory Minecraft poster, which has to be there. But it's actually it actually looks pretty cool. So, yep, yep. you know, and then we've got like some some things up for him. But I think that's really important to make inside spaces and outside spaces. So I think you've got that in spades yeah, now yeah. on the for the for the college kids that want to go tracking that way. We're having all the same cool experiences and you're partnering with the community college. You know what? What is the the curriculum or the messaging from the teachers in your school versus the everybody's got to go to college or your failure type of messaging we we know that's happening. 
I'll start by saying and being a former high school principal, you know, the other exciting piece with this school is like we are building the culture, we're not shifting a culture. And so it's right in our mission within six months of graduation, a graduate should be enrolled in a post-secondary institution, college, apprenticeship, four-year university, to be a community college, whatever it may be, some type of post-secondary institution or employed. So that's our goal. And then uh, in terms of what are the staff teaching and how are they doing that? Like I said, we have those externships that help to inform the model. We've brought in industry partners to collaborate on the curriculum. And then our director of curriculum instruction also has a background uh, developing CT pathways and also implementing an integrated curriculum. So uh, the intention and intentionality behind the school is that no teacher is operating in isolation, math collaborating with science, with English, and we're actually, we, we, we're holding teachers accountable to that because we've done something pretty unique with the pay scale. Every single uh, school pretty much around the country, you're gonna have a traditional step scale. You've been teaching four years, you get to year four on the pay scale. Next year, you get a, an increase. Next year, you keep going down. What we've done is we've grouped the, the categories by two years. You're a year one employee, year two employee, you're paid the same rate, uh, you know, three, four, all the way down. But what's interesting is we've developed and, and you know, oversimplified a number of metrics uh, that promote collaboration, that hold teachers accountable, all teachers for reading, writing scores, uh, that encourages teachers to bring in community partners, uh, encourages them to take students out into the real world. And at the end of the year, uh, teachers have up to the opportunity to earn up to an 8% annual bonus that's paid out before summer. Uh, and the other additive to that bonus is that they actually jump on the pay scale into the next category. So theoretically, a year three teacher at our school could be making what a year six teacher is making at the school down the street. Uh, and again, we hope that that model will incentivize us to work towards that collective culture that we're really trying to build. Yeah, that's uh, super lucky. And I think you nailed it. Like you're you're making the culture and a lot of it's going to be informed by the philosophy and the frustration of the alternatives. So I think you're, you're creating a magnet to attract exactly the right type of people to keep for a super high engagement with the kids. It's just what, what kids want. Nobody wants to come to school and just get lectured at all day. And even like, as you talked about the classroom design, I've uh, studied, I do a lot of like corporate training and training in industry in construction, that's that's part of what you have to do when you get to be this old, Kevin. You have to give back. <laughs> and uh, one one of the things that I found was this book uh, by, a, a, I think she was a researcher originally, or studied neuroscience. I'm going to forget her credentials, but uh, Sharon Bowman. And the book is called Training from the Back of the Room. Mm. And it's really just as fundamental as the things, everything you talked about, it's in her book. Nice. Right? There's nice. cutting edge neuroscience says yeah. that that people learn experientially with their, yep. all their senses. And that there's a, when you can change people's environment, it just yep. opens them up into a totally different way. I mean, this, this is why I got that light on over there behind me. It's just my, I want my environment to be nice. Yep. And I want, I want you to have something nice to look at besides me. So we make like the interesting thing. You're probably wondering like, what's that thing over his head? It's a, it's a copper bottle, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. It's just a, something interesting, right? So, then like in your classroom, you're going to have these TVs where kids can share. I think that's super important that kids can present as equal as teachers are presenting, yeah. right? So, it's a good yeah. exchange of ideas because, you know, sometimes kids actually know something and sometimes 100%. they don't. <laughs> 100%. Um, you know, one of the other things that you said that I think just, just uh, reminded me when, when you were talking about that. And it's something we've been rallying against is, you know, no kid comes to school to fail. And I think the status quo has just been so unacceptable that it's like, oh, well, you know, they're just not the right kid. Or, you know, no kid wakes up and wants to just just be a failure at school. Right. But right. if they're told that so many times, then that becomes the expectation. That becomes their reality. And uh, the, the local comprehensive high school as one of, it is one of the lowest performing schools in, in Sacramento County. It has a 60%, 64% graduation rate. That means a third of the kids aren't graduating, right? right. And so there is, something is fundamentally wrong with that. And how okay, are we as a society okay to just be like, yeah, you know, it happened. I did a presentation last night. I, I pulled the countywide graduation rates. 
84%. I was like, man, that sounds pretty good. I said, give me the numbers for that. There was over 16,000 high school seniors in Sacramento County that didn't graduate last year. Think about what that means for our society. What is, what's going to happen to these kids? What yeah. path are they already on? And, and, you know, again, our school, like our goal is to catch those kids that are slipping through the tracks, the cracks that are disengaged by, by the current model of education. I want to get them excited about learning, right? And, and again, it's a school where a kid wants to be super motivated. You can leave our high school with up to three years of college done. It's putting that equal weight on both college and career and giving young people a voice. Absolutely. Kevin, I think it's going to have a huge impact in, in Sacramento. And, and those numbers are unacceptable numbers. That's way too yeah. high, especially in, in today's current market. Like as you look out, everyone's saying like, it's the hottest job market ever, but there are yeah. barriers to entry. Yeah. All of these types of jobs and not having a high school diploma is definitely a barrier to entry. I can't think of opportunities that are beyond minimum wage unless you're yeah. super creative and you can be one of the makers creators, which are rare. It's yep. not easy for people and we should yep. be making it so that we can have that type of environment. And I, I agree with you. Like when we see systemic numbers like that year over year over year, we've yep. got to step back and say, this curriculum is failing these kids because it's not yep. the other way around. The kids are the same kids like you and I were. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's, um, man, it's, it's just, I don't know. Again, I, I feel this you know, sense of responsibility, but also just such excitement. And, you know, here's my shameless plug. It, it's the only way that we're going to be successful and be able to fulfill our mission is if we bring in those industry partners and community partners. Again, I mean, it's that old saying, right? It takes a village. And so it, it's how do we do that in a sustainable way and just tap into the best practices that are already happening in our community. That's right. So people, I'm going to leave you with this. Like, as you watch this show, I want you to be thinking that Kevin and Felipe will be connecting and there will be TikToks coming <laughs> from the <laughs> campus. Kevin, Good thank dude. you so much for taking the time out of your day to take a pause from construction and from, uh, from helping set the future generations. We definitely have way more to talk about and I'd love to have you on the show again in the future and we could actually do it from the school. That would be, how about, and then we can include some of the kids. So that would be amazing. So Felipe, thank you so much for hosting me, taking the time. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build. <laughs>